here this morning. Glad that you're with us today. If you're visiting today, we're glad that you're here. My name is Steve Kelly. I'm the preaching minister here, and we're glad that you've taken time to join with us on worship. If you haven't had a chance to get a welcome packet, there are some out in the foyer at the welcome desk. The blue folder has information about the church and things that we have going on. We'd love for you to just take one of those and uh, get familiar with some of the stuff that we have here. That water cup's out there. It's free for you to take. Just our way of saying thank you. We're glad that you're here today. Before I get into the uh, message and stuff this morning. I just want to take some time to uh, thank our eldership for allowing me uh, time off the last uh, couple of weeks to work through some issues and take some time to renew uh, myself and the Lord. And I want to thank uh, Tim and Larry, especially for filling in preaching for me and the guys who uh, filled in on teaching Wednesday night and just everybody who kind of helped make everything happen while I was gone. I, I'm very, very grateful for all that has gone on. I know that everyone, uh, not everyone, but there have been several who have been asking, you know, what's going on? Where's Steve at? Uh, when's he coming back? And, and rumors gone around, you know, that, well, he, he's out, he's interviewing and taking another job and preaching other places and, and all those kind of things. I know how all that happens. So let me just set the record straight that none of that happened. I did not preach anywhere for four weeks. I wasn't interviewing anywhere. Um, I was in Joplin, Missouri at a conference. I did fall in love with Joplin. I thought it was a beautiful place. I'd never been there before. I drove on Route 66, which was awesome. I went down through three states and like took pictures over, you know, Rainbow Bridge and all this different stuff uh, that was there. Um, but then the weather turned cold and windy again. And I was like, oh my goodness, who would live in Missouri? But um, <laughs> so we've come back here. Um, <clears throat> but what I want to do though, is uh, take some time to walk you through what has been going on in my life um, over the last uh, uh, year or so, and really what's gone on in the last couple uh, of weeks. Uh, let me first say that I am not looking for any sympathy from the congregation uh, in anything that I'm going to share with you today or in the next few weeks. Uh, that's not my point of that. I, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not trying to have a woe is me kind of moment and uh, let's just feel bad for poor Steve. Um, I want to share with you what I've been going through because I know that there are other people going through it as well in the congregation. And, uh, you know, the Christian life is not always up on the mountaintop experience. It's not where we live. Um, and we don't always live in the valley either. We are constantly in between. Great experiences, valley lows, great experiences, valley lows, and everywhere in between. Um, and and it, learning how to deal with the highs and lows of everything is very important in, the Christian, in our Christian walk. Most of us deal very well with the highs. We don't deal very well with the lows. And I'll just tell you, I was not dealing very well with a low time in my life, and yet God has been um, working through that and teaching me some stuff that he is continuing to teach me. Lessons that I would have thought, honestly, I should have known by now, but... Um, you know, we seem to always be forgetting lessons in the Lord and we have to learn them over and over again. Let me just kind of share a little background. You know, I've been preaching in a, in a located ministry full time now for about 18 years in three different churches. And during that time, I've averaged preaching between 49 to 50 weeks out of 52 weeks a year. And uh, most senior ministers now are preaching in the mid-30s out of 52 weeks a year. They preach about 30-some weeks a year, allows them some time off to think about different things. And, and that's wonderful when you have the staff and the ability to do that. We don't really have that ability to do that here, uh, to be out of the pulpit so much. And that's just kind of how the job runs and that sort of thing there. So... All these different years, I've been preaching and preaching and preaching. In some of those early churches, I was preaching Sunday morning. I would preach a sermon on Sunday night. I would teach a Wednesday Bible study and then do a small group as well. And, and, and that kind of job pace uh, kind of carries on and had carried on even to my time here. And that's, that's not good. It does exhaust you after a while. You only have so many talents and so much skill to give. Over the last few years, um, the time here at uh, LACC has been extremely trying for me. Things have been good. Great things are happening. 
Um, we're new hiring positions. I met with uh, Lizzie Stevenson while I was in, uh, out in Missouri and we drove over to Kansas to meet with her. I wasn't here to do that when they were here, but she's going to be coming on as our children's, uh, in a children's directing position and take over some of our children's ministry stuff to free up uh, Derek to expand with our, our student ministries, junior high and high school. Derek's involvement here has been a great blessing to me. Michelle's on staff and, and helps with that. Carl's on staff and Mark on staff. We have a lot of great things going on here that are moving the church forward. Great ministries that are happening. One of our most outreach-driven ministries on the adult side of things is the Celebrate Recovery. You know, hundreds of hours have gone into that. People give countless time every week to put in to Celebrate Recovery, to reach out to those who are dealing with a hurt, a habit, or a hang-up, a great, great uh, thing for our area. There's nothing like that in Lehigh, uh, doing those sorts of things. Our budget has been increasing, and we've done so many different things with our sound system being done. Uh, here. We're working on, on the lights as our next major project. Our air conditioner things. Uh, we've done some improvements to the building in different areas. Lots of good things are happening. People are increasing. Uh, you look at our, our growth numbers have been growing and, and we're, we're averaging now on that 260 or so uh, adults alone on Sunday morning worship between the two services here. A lot of good things are going on. And we want to give God praise for all that. But even in the midst of all of those things, there still can be sadness. And there was in my life. In the midst of all that good that was happening, there are still hard times. There is still criticism that comes. Attacks from Satan, attacks from those who you love and those who you try to serve to the point where you don't feel like serving anymore. Just before I left a few weeks ago, for, for several weeks, it was every single day I received some sort of attack, some sort of criticism, some sort of complaint of something that I had done, the way I had made a decision, or even being responsible for things that I had nothing to do with. And it just sort of comes with the territory. Now, any one of those things would not be enough to put any of us probably over the edge. All of us deal with criticism and attacks and stuff like that and, and disgruntledness from day to day. But when, when it begins to build up, and for me, it felt like this tidal wave that was just building and building and building. And finally, it just, I snapped and it just kind of crashed over me. And I felt like the whole house of cards came tumbling down. I found myself just on the edge. I was angry at the church. I was angry at God for feeling like he had left me alone, wasn't listening to me. I felt I didn't feel like preaching anymore. I didn't want to be in the church anymore. I didn't want to be in the ministry anymore. In fact, my prayers for Jesus were simply this, either Jesus come or take me home. I finally talked to the elders and I told them how I was feeling, which was a very, very difficult thing for me. I'm usually not one to ask for help and tell people how, I, how I'm feeling, especially on the inside. And I told them I needed to get some help. I was ready to just walk out of it all. They were gracious enough and, and I think wise enough to recognize that Steve's got problems. I know most of you already knew that, but they recognized that, that Steve's got some problems. And they took to heart what I was really saying and they knew that I wasn't uh, uh, over-exaggerating how I felt. And so they worked with me to get some time off. Uh, and, and things just happened to fall in place where uh, I spent some time for a week long at an intense counseling thing. Michelle and I together at an intense counseling uh, sessions uh, in Tampa with an organization that specifically uh, deals with burned out preachers and, men, and missionaries and things like that to help them kind of find the, uh, the, the call of God in their lives. It was a great blessing to us. I took some time to just have God's word word poured back into me at a preaching and teaching conference there. I tried to take some time on my own to just do some reading and pray and it didn't work out so well. I'll share with you that and as we move on here in a little bit. But I just say all that to say this, that there's been a journey in my life and I just want to share with you that journey because I know some of you are on that journey and some of you have been through that and some of you are getting ready to go through that. And I want you to know that above all else in the church, I want the church to be a family. I'm a pretty real person. There's not much that happens on, on Sunday that isn't going to happen during the week. And I think that we need to be real with one another so that we can be healed and so that we can uh, overcome those things. God never called the church together to be fake. And yet we live in a stained glass masquerade where we come in and we put on our smiles and we say, hey, how are you doing today? I mean, everyone I talk to today, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. I'm like, really? Because I'm not doing so great. <laughs> you know, 
I know you're not doing so great either. You know, your spouses talk. They tell me the truth. They're like, yeah, he's got problems. <laughs> She's crazy. You know, so I know the real deal here, okay? We need to be real with one another. And I just want to be real with you. And I hope that what I'm going to share with you helps. I know that the ministry is not the only job where people get burned out. We get burned out from all kinds of things. And we can get burned out in any of the jobs that we're at. I just want to share with you one of the problems with being burned out in the ministry is that is, I think, different from other jobs. And I have had other jobs before. When that job was going south, I still could love my church. When your job is the church and it's going south, where do you go? If, you, if your job is a church and you, you think the church is going south, you don't want to go to church. If you're preaching about God and reading about God, you don't, want, you don't want to talk to God. So you think, where do you go? Do you go to the bottle to drown it away? Do you go to the internet to let, it, let the fantasy go away? Do you go to the drug dealer to numb the pain? All of those things would only bring you deeper into the pit. And you know that's not where you want to go. So you have to learn to refresh yourself in the Lord. And I want to just share with you what I have learned and what I am continuing to learn about refreshing yourself and the Lord when you go through a desert time, how can you find some water to quench the thirst you have? That's what I want to do with you this morning. Can I do that? Is it okay to do that? Uh, all right. Because I'm going to do it anyway, even if you say no, you know. Now, I'm just going to tell you now, I'm probably going to preach a little long. Cove already told me as soon as I got back, Cove said, Mr. Steve, sermons have all been on time since you've been gone. So I don't know. <laughs> I was already saying, hey, your family's going to be missing a child today. But anyway, you know, <laughs> so I'm just telling you right up front, I practiced it. And I ran 38 minutes. So, uh, and I ran over this morning, but uh, God's just laid this on my heart. So just please bear with me if I run a little long, okay? Let me pray. God, thank you for this day that you've given us. And I thank you for allowing me to be here, even in uh, my brokenness and my frailty. Father, I am scared to death to preach. I, I didn't want to come this morning. You know that. Father, this is a message that you've laid on my heart and I just pray that you would use me to be your servant this morning because I know there are hurting people in every time we gather together. I'm not alone in how I feel and they are not alone in how they feel. So speak to us through your word, through my experience, Father, that we might glorify Christ in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the back of your bulletin is an outline. I wanna just kind of walk you through um, a, a little outline scenario I've set up, which is the problem. I want to go through that, the result of those problems. Uh, I want to talk about what I've learned in dealing with some recovery steps. And I just want to give you a kind of a final lesson that I've learned in that one thing. Let me deal with the problem. There are lots of problems that I have found in my life, but I want to just kind of boil them down to five or six here. Number one was this, work began to equal my worth. Guys, I think, understand this point better than women. I'm just saying that because most guys I know, who they are and how they feel about themselves is completely tied up in what they do. Guys, am I right? Give me an amen if I'm right. Amen. amen. Yeah, you know, and you know, you know this is true because when we get together, we always ask the question, what do you do? We want to know what they do. Even as young boys, we get together. Well, what's your dad do? What I do? And we, we, we stratify ourselves based on, on what our parents do or what we have done ourselves. And we try to determine, do I have the right to speak into this person's life? And do they have the right to speak into my life, depending on what they do? Are they much smarter than me? Are they much wealthier than me? Are they more powerful than me? Are they stronger than me? Are they whatever it is? And we try to put all of our, we start to determine our worth by what we do. I grew up in a house where adoration was very rarely expressed. Hey, good job, that's great, I'm proud of you, those kind of things. Those types of words were not said very often. When they were said, they were always tied to an activity. They were tied to my involvement, my work. If I worked hard out in the field, if I cut the grass or pulled in a, brought in a lot of firewood or whatever, that sort of thing, then I would hear, uh, you know, you did a good job. And so it's every kid wants to hear you did a good job. Then I found myself working harder and harder and harder so that I could hear those things because how I felt about myself was determined by how much work I do. Many of us have made this mistake in our lives where we have let our work define our worth. And the problem is, is that when work becomes bad, or we perceive it to be bad, then we have now determined that we ourselves are bad. 
If work seems worthless, then we have determined that we are worthless. If work is going down, it must be our fault. If people aren't coming to the Lord, it must be your preaching. If, if, if uh, people are not excited, it must be you. And then you start asking yourself, well, it must be your prayer life, your personal life, your preaching, your singing ability. Your and you start to tear yourself down because you perceive your work as not being very valuable anymore. And then therefore your worth is not very valuable. Let me just tell you that that is a false statement. Amen. It is a total lie. And yet we buy into it so much. And guys, we tear ourselves down and we compare ourselves to other people for no real reason at all. God has made us all unique. There is only one Steve in the world. And thank God for that, right? <laughs> Don't worry, there's only one you. And we thank God for that as well, okay? But God values us over our actions. He values who we are over what we do. The second problem that I found was this. My personal prayer time had stopped. Oh, I would pray before I got ready to preach. I would pray before a Wednesday night study. I would pray in our staff meetings. But praying for that inner, inner fulfillment, just me and my time with God had ceased. It is hard to pray when you feel like God is not listening. It is hard to pray for the church and for people in the church when they are the ones that are criticizing you and attacking you and talking about you. You don't feel like praying for them. And I so foolishly became so tired and preoccupied to pray that I just stopped doing it. The very lifeline of God the Father was severed, not because of anything that God had done, but because I had chosen to stop speaking to the Father. And let me just tell you, when you stop praying to the Father, you start dying. When you stop praying to God, then you, you are, you are not, you're not even maintaining anymore. You are sliding back. And my prayer life was gone. I just didn't feel like doing it. I didn't want to do it. And I started to find myself sliding into this spiritual temper tantrum where I thought, I'm not going to do this. As if God's like, oh, you're hurting my feelings, Steve. I must change. God's not going to change. He knew the only person that was really getting hurt. Yes, the father was hurt because his son wasn't talking to him. But he knew the person who was really being hurt was me and my spiritual life. Folks, when you stop praying, you start dying spiritually. The third problem I found in my life was this. My personal Bible study time had stopped. Oh, I was reading to prepare a sermon. I was reading to go through on a Wednesday night and that sort of stuff. But reading just to be fulfilled because I was in God's Word had stopped. You know... People I've heard say to me, man, I would love to have your job where I could just read the Bible every day and I could write messages and I could pray and, 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 and do this for a living. And there is a great privilege to that. I mean, if you talk to Derek, I think he would agree there's a great privilege that we have, those who've been in the ministry, Larry, Tim, others who have been in the ministry, there's a great privilege that we have in being able to do that. But I would also tell you there's a great curse that comes with that as well that people don't realize. And here's the curse. Guys, you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. The curse is this. When you do that every single day, the Bible can very easily become a textbook instead of the good book. You read it to prepare for the next lesson. You read it to figure out three points, two preachable applications, something that's going to transform someone's life. You're not reading it to fill your soul, to fill the well within you. And I began to just read it, to just read it, to teach it. And there's a difference between talking about God and knowing God. You know there's a difference there, right? You can talk about God, you can read about God, but that's not the same as knowing God. God's Word is more than a textbook. It is the instructional book for our lives. And when you stop reading the Word of God, once again, like prayer, you are already dying. What food will feed you? Who will speak into your life when the world says that you stink? When the world says that you're no good? When a spouse criticizes you, when a child criticizes you, when a boss criticizes you, a peer, a church member, an elder, or someone else criticizes you, <clears throat> and you're not in the Word of God, who's going to counter those things? You have to be in, in the Word of God, and I wasn't in the Word of God like I needed to be, like you need to be. The fourth problem was this. Worship became a point of frustration instead of a time of praise to God. It became a point of frustration in my life instead of a time when I was ready to praise God. 
God desires for corporate church worship, the body worship, what we are doing right now, to be a time of refreshing, restoration, and renewal. It is a time where we come in and we are refreshed just being in the presence of God. A time when we are restored from the old person that we were to the new person that God wants us to be. And a time when we are renewed for the day and the week that is lying ahead of us. When we come into the church, if the church is not refreshing and it's not restoring and it's not renewing you, it is not helping you. But I had allowed my mind to be concerned with so many other things instead of coming in and hoping for a time of refreshment and waiting for that time of restoration and preparing for that time of renewal, I came in worried about who's going to be upset at me today. Who's going to be mad because my sermon went too long? I know none of you. That's always the first crowd. <laughs> this is good Christians come at this hour, right? <laughs> yeah, some of you are going to go tell that first Christian in that first hour and then I'll have to deal with this sermon all over again. But I was worried about, was my sermon going to be too long? Was it even going to be impacting? Was the music going to be okay? Was there going to be dead time in the thing? Was a mic not going to work? Would a guitar squeal? Would, would something happen? And, and I'm worried about, did someone sit in their seat? Someone, someone complained about something? Someone was mad at somebody else? And they got to tell someone, so where's Steve? I got to tell him. And I was so worried about all those different things that I didn't want to be in worship. I didn't want to come to worship. I didn't feel like worship. Guys, understand this, that good music matters. I get that. I understand that. that. That respecting people's time matters and trying to stay within everybody's schedule. I get that. That having everything set right and chairs ready and all that stuff matter. All those things are important. And I'm not knocking any of those things. They all have their proper place. But what is most important that will happen on this morning is the attitude that you and I have when we come here. It's the attitude of everybody. It's not just the attitude of those who are up on stage, which is what I think most people think about in the church. The preacher should come in here happy because we're paying him to come in here and be happy. Derek should always be smiling when little kids come in and, and, and because we're paying him to be the youth minister to smile when little kids come in. You don't always feel like that, do you? I know it. Yeah, he's smiling now. He's lying in church, man, lying in church. Most days we are excited. But there are days when you go to work, you don't feel like being there. There are days when you sit with your spouse, you don't feel like talking to them. There are days when your kids want to do something, you go, I don't want to, I don't want to spend time throwing the ball in there. Well, there are days when I come in here, I'm like, I just don't feel like preaching. He doesn't feel like teaching. We don't feel like praying because there's something going on. In our life. But you got to come in with an attitude that says, God, it's not about me. If Mark were to get up here and say, well, hey, let's all stand up and let's sing a song. Dum, dum, because that's what bass players do, right? Dum, dum. You know, you would be all down, you know. I mean, if, if, if someone came up here to do a communion, thought, well, so, you know, it, you know, well, I, it's time for the bread and wine. So, okay, let's pray. Think about Jesus. You're bad sinners. That wouldn't be very touching to us. If I said, well, let's open up to Leviticus chapter 12. Let's go over some laws about thou shalt not do this. And you got to obey all these rules. And just, oh, Jesus said this. And Paul did that. And Moses said this. All right, let's play and go eat. That wouldn't be exciting at all. We want to come in here excited and upbeat and lifted up. Well, let me tell you, when you come in here, you need to be that way too. I don't want to preach to a bunch of sour faces. Let's get this over with. <laughs> It's discouraging. It's depressing. So if you can't smile, put a mask on and put that on your face and come in so everyone can see. You know, you, we got to come in with an attitude that says that we are ready to worship the Lord. And I'll just tell you, my attitude was in the toilet. And some of yours is in the toilet too at times. And when your attitude is like that, you're not going to get anything out of it. It doesn't matter who's preaching. It doesn't matter what songs are being sung. You're not going to praise God. You're not going to enter into his presence. And that was my problem. The next problem was this. In my relationships, I became isolated instead of inviting. When things began to go south in my soul and in my spirit, instead of reaching out to get help and support, I did what I do best. And some of you do this too. I pushed it all inside. I repressed it. And I said, suck it up and go on. Ignore it and it'll go away. I'll push through this. It'll get better. Next week will be better. Next month will be better. Next summer will be better. If I can just hold on to 2017. And if you're saying that on January 2nd, 2016, that's not good. So I began to isolate myself and build up walls. I don't want to talk about anything. I don't really want to let people know what's going on on the inside because I'm okay. 
Guys, God created us to live in community with one another. He never created us to go through life by ourselves, to do this ministry thing or this Christian walk thing by ourselves. Jesus did not do his ministry single-handed, right? He had 12 guys that he brought around him. Now, granted, one of them wasn't so good. I get it. But they replaced him and they moved on. And he spent life with those guys. He, did, he spent time with those guys. He did ministry with those guys. He taught those guys. He laughed with those guys. He was frustrated with those guys. But he did life with those guys. And he had three guys that were even closer than the rest. Peter, James, and John. That inner three that he allowed to see a little bit more of himself. They saw him be transfigured there on the mount. He was there when the girl was raised back to life. And they were the ones that he asked to come in and be as close to me as possible. Right before he went to the cross and pray. And they fell asleep. But he asked them, being alone is never where God wanted you to be. And we learn that from the very beginning of the Bible, right? In the beginning, when it talks about creation, the one thing that was not mentioned as being good in creation was the singleness of man. It says, it is not good for man to be alone. And God made a suitable helper for him so that he would be in communion with someone. If you're living life by yourself, and there are many of you who are doing that. You come in and you sit by yourself. You don't talk to anybody. You don't get involved in anybody's life. And you walk right out the door. Let me just tell you, you're on a pathway for death. Spiritual death. Isolation. Before long, I guarantee you, you will leave the church. Statistically, it shows if you're not connected, have an interpersonal relationship and something that brings you there, it doesn't matter how good the preaching is or how great the songs are, you will not stay if you don't know anybody. Which is why we wear our name tags. I'm glad to see a lot of you on there. Because a name tag says, I want to be known and I want to know you. I'm I just want to encourage everyone, every time you come in here, put on a name tag. We got them out there on the wall. We'll print one up for you. Put a sticker on there that says, we'll put a smiley face on there if you want. Because we want to know who you are, and I want you to know who I am so I, so I don't look dumb when I go, what's your name again? And you'll be like, I've been here for seven months. Oh, we'll put a name tag on and I'd know you. So that we can know one another because God has created us to be in relationship and I wasn't in relationship, I was isolating everyone. Now what was the result of all that? It came to this. I became spiritually dry in an empty wasteland inside. I became spiritually dry and just an empty wasteland inside. I was depressed, I was discouraged, I felt worthless, I didn't feel like I had anything to give to anyone. I had nothing to say when I preached. I thought my, my sermons were shallow. I thought my lessons were not impacting. I just didn't feel like doing anything at all. I began to deal with suicidal thoughts. I just wanted everything to end. And to be honest, knowing the great pain that that would cause my family was the only thing that kept me from checking out. Some of you are in that spot now. And let me tell you, get some help. Talk to somebody. Tell somebody. Because we feel like we're in a pit. And we feel like we will never get out of this pit. But I heard one person say, you're not in a pit, you're in a tunnel. There is an end. There is a light. And you just need to keep going towards that. I know right around you, it feels like everything is being pressed in. And you don't want to go back to where you were, but you can move forward and God will bring you out of it. Now let me kind of bring us into some positive things because I, I don't want to stay in the negative stuff, amen? Nobody wants to stay down there. Let me walk you through some steps of recovery and healing that I have found in my life to kind of counter some of these problems. Number one was this. I needed to redefine my worth in Christ. You have to redefine your worth in Christ. No one's going to be a bigger cheerleader for you than Jesus. He loves you above everything else. Now, let me put some Bible to all of this because I know some of you are saying, hey, are you going to preach from the Bible? Yes. Go to Leviticus 12. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Paul says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, he says, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I have preached this message so many times, just saying, yeah, you know, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And I talk about this great love, you know, that he died. But it didn't really resonate until I started understanding that in, in light of what I was going through. Before I was a preacher, Christ died for me. Before I was saved, Christ died for me. Before I was a dad, Christ died for me. Before I was a husband, Christ died for me. Before I was anything else in my life, Christ died for me. And Paul goes so far as to say this in Ephesians, that while we were alienated from God, enemies of God, and that's a word that means to contend with God, that while we were fighting with God, God was willing 
willing to die for us. So you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be great. You don't have to be a wonderful Bible study person, a wonderful prayer meditation person, fasting person. You just have to be a broken person who says, Father God, I need you because he died for you even while we were still trash, sinners. And I had to learn to, dis to discover myself and define myself in Christ. I have two books on my, on my shelf. They're the same book. They're called The Search for Significance. How many of you read that book? Any of you? A few of you? There was a few in the last class as well. You guys are the good Christians, by the way. <laughs> But that whole book there, The Search for Significance, is this. It's about redefining your value and your worth in God. Finding your significance in that. Do not find it in being a mother or a father or, or some, some position in your work, a CEO or a preacher or an elder or a Sunday school teacher. Because all of those things are fleeting, right? I mean, we stink as parents. All of us say, where's the manual? We screw, you know, we screw, we always screw up the first child, right? The second one, not so much. But you're always messing up one of them, right? Some of you are that screwed up child, and believe me, we know it, okay? And so, you know, we, 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 mess, we mess up in our marriages. It wasn't supposed to be this funny. It wasn't this funny last time. We mess up in our marriages. We mess up in our jobs. We do stupid things from time to time and all that. And if that's where you're finding your significance, man, you're going to be on the bottom of the barrel at some point. Carl was just talking. I'm telling a story on Carl. There he is, brother. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell this story on you. Do I got permission? Yes? Okay. If you say no, I'm going to do it anyway because they don't know that you're saying no. But Carl was telling a story just, just this week. We were going to lunch. He was telling a story about backing up this semi-trailer and he, it was at night. It was raining. There was all, he had all these excuses. But it was night. It was raining and all this stuff. But he backs his semi-trailer up in this part of the parking lot that they had cut out to do some repair so there was no pavement there. And when he unhooked it, the the trailer sank. <laughs> now, I don't know how you tell your bosses what happened to the trailer. I sank it out in the parking lot, you know? And I said, I bet the guys harassed you a lot for that one. He's like, yeah, they had to call up and get a crane to lift this thing up out of there. And so when I feel bad, I just say, at least I didn't pull a Carl. And you can do that now, too. <laughs> Man, if you're searching for your significance in the things that you do, you're never going to find it. Redefine your worth in God. God loves you, people. He loves you who you are. He wants you to be better, yes, but he loves you where you are. Number two is this. I had to commit to praying every day. And I would just tell you, there's no great answer to this other than to say, you just got to do it. You just have to do it. 1 Chronicles 16 verse 11 says, Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. And Paul says it like this in 1 Thessalonians 5 17. Pray continually. I mean, he only says two words. Pray continually. Always come to the, always come to the Father who loves you. Bill Hybrels, the preacher at the Willow, Willow Creek Big Church in, in uh, Chicago, right? We've read all of the different books. But he wrote a book one time called uh, Too Busy Not to Pray or Too Busy to Not Pray. I can't remember exactly how the title went. But the idea was this, that your life is so complex and so complicated and so full that you, you cannot afford not to pray. You have to be praying. It made me think about the words, and I threw Darren under the bus. I'm going to do it again because I'm sure he has this MC Hammer album in his 1990 MC Hammer. I bet he can still do, 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 do. can't touch this, right? And so, but the song was called Pray, right? How many of you remember the MC Hammer Pray? Yeah. Oh, sing it, sister. Yeah, it was like this. <laughs> she knows it. She's like, oh, yeah, I got it still. It, the words went like this. I got to pray just to make it today, right? And he'd be like, we got to pray just to make it today. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, oh, oh. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, he danced better than me. They just told me he's a preacher. I guess I'll let anyone preach now. But anyway, I don't know. Maybe that's true. That's a, <laughs> Darren said that, but you can't believe what he says. So... But the idea was this. Now, I don't think MC Hammer was a great theologian back then, and I don't really know where his life is today. I hope he's in the Lord. That sounds great if it is. But I don't think that he recognized the truth that was being said in that secular song, and that is that we need to pray daily. 
I think that's why the Lord's Prayer says, give us this day our daily bread. I don't think it's just talking about eating sustenance for the day, although there was that application. It was because we need a daily dose of God in our lives. We need a daily dose of Jesus. If you're struggling, let me encourage you to release your grip and your resistance to God and simply pray to the Father who truly does love you. He hears your cries. He hears your pain. He sees your struggles. And whether he answers your prayers in the way that you and I want or not, does not make a difference that he is an almighty God. We just need to keep praying. Because when we stop praying, we start dying. And I wasn't praying. And I got to tell you, it was hard because I didn't want to pray. I was mad. I was ticked off at God. But I started. Number three is this. I had to learn to spend time at the well, which is the word of God. Matthew 4, 4 says this, Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. When Jesus was in his desert time and Satan was attacking him and Satan was trying to derail him, Jesus went to the word of God to defend himself in that situation and to encourage him. Peter says it like this in 1 Peter 2, 2, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. And David says in Psalm 119, 105, we love this passage, right? Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. We have to be in the word of God because that is how we live. And like a baby that needs that nourishing, that baby formula to help their bones grow and their muscles grow and their brain and organs develop, we need that as well. We need a word of God to rejuvenate us and restore us and, and build back the things that get tore down every single day by the world around us. And how can you possibly walk and know where you're walking if you're not guided by the word of God? I love the Word of God. I love to hear preaching. It is the thing that speaks to me the most. Some of you are not that way. Some of you, it's a quiet time. It's a prayer time. It's a meditation time. It's listening to songs or being involved in a worship thing. But the thing that speaks to me the most is to hear the Word of God taught rightly and correctly. I could listen to preaching all day long. I could listen to a lecture all day long. Michelle's not that way. She likes the more experiential stuff, prayer and worship and that sort of thing. That's fine. But be where God is speaking to you. I went out on my, on my own out to Fish Eating Creek. That's what I did the first three days. I was out there by myself and every day something went wrong. The battery blew up and, and gas got inside the, the thing and it wasn't just for me. And it was terrible. I mean, there was all kinds of problems. Things went wrong and I would go out every day and I would try to pray and I would try to read. I'd try to sing some worship songs. I was so mad I was going to throw my guitar in the lake out there. But I didn't want to buy a new guitar, so that kept me from throwing it in the lake. But I was so angry and I was so frustrated, I yelled at the top of my lungs, my fist clenched up to God. I was screaming at God, I was cursing God and saying some really bad things to him. I'm surprised he didn't strike me dead, because I would have done that to me, but he loved me. I just had to let all of that go for a moment and just come to a point where it was like, God, let your word speak to me. I was, just, I was at a point where I couldn't, that wasn't helping anymore. I wasn't able to refresh myself, even reading the scriptures. I read 80 of the Psalms because I thought, oh, read the Psalms. You know, David and the Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 23. Well, other than like Psalm 23, from 1 to 80 is very depressing. If you've read them, it's basically about David saying, God, when are you going to show up? All of my enemies are around me. And I'm like, yes, that's me. They're all around me. Let's have some love in the Psalms here, David. And I stopped reading because I was so frustrated. But I am convinced that there's no substitute for the word of God. When I went out to Ozark and I sat there, I sat under this guy named Kenny Bowles who was a New Testament professor and he taught, he taught classes and there was all kinds of classes I could go to about like how to grow your church. and just, I didn't need another class of how to do things right in the ministry. I'd already messed all that up. I'm, not, I'm done with that. I just wanted to hear the word of God. I wanted someone to teach me and I just sat and he taught about the six significant things in the gospel of John that aren't in the other gospels, stuff I did not know. And I soaked it in like a sponge. And then when I was done with that, I went to three sermons and listened to that. And then I came home and read my Bible and prayed. I was Jesus out by the end of the night. You know what I'm saying? Just immersing myself in the word of God. There is no substitute for the word of God. Listen to the Apostle Paul. 2 Timothy 3.16, one of my favorite passages of the Bible. It's highlighted in my Bible. And it should be highlighted in yours. If not, 
You're not a good Bible student. Highlight it, all right? Because this is what it says. All Scripture is God-breathed. I like that better than inspired because it really means that God gives life to that. And I like to tie that into where God breathed into the nostrils of man and became a living being. I think about God breathing the Word and the Word is alive and active as the Hebrew writer says. God breathed and it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. All the things that I needed. I needed to be taught how to come out of the desert. I needed to be rebuked for my attitude towards God. I needed to be corrected for the thinking that I allowed in my mind. And I needed to be trained in what God was wanting me to do in the future. And it was all right there in front of me, but I didn't want to open it. And I was unable to read it until someone helped pour back into my life. You need people pouring the word of God into your life more than just this Sunday morning hour. You need to be back on a Wednesday night. You need to be in a small study group. Listen to Christian radio. Go watch sermons online. Some of the greatest preaching in the world is so available at your fingertips. Let people pour into you because the word of God is the breath of God. It is the milk for our souls. It is the meat for our growth. It is the lifeblood for the believer. And if you are in a spiritual desert, you need to come to the wellspring and it's God's word. I can't say anything more about that. Let me move on. I had to learn to be moved by worship again. 1 Chronicles 16, 23 says, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among the people. Sing to the Lord. Let the earth know it. Talk about the salvation that he has brought to us every single day after day after day after day. Declare the great glories to everyone that is around and the marvelous, wonderful things that are happening. That helps you from getting depressed when you think about all the things that God is doing in a positive way. I actually had to go and make a list of how God had been moving in my life just to be reminded that he still is there. I had hardened my spirit to the point that worship was not impacting me anymore. There's a song that's popular on the radio. Adam was playing it even at the, at the, in, in the intermission time here. And I said, you're playing my song. And he's like, no, Spotify's playing it. So it was God speaking. But here was the song. It's called, You're a Good, Good Father, right? You've heard this on the radio now. You're a good, good father. That's who you are, that's who you are. And I'm loved by you, that's who I am, that's who I am. I hated that song. Every time it would be sung, every time it it would anger me, I would grit my teeth and I would think, stop playing that song because it's not true. He's not a good father. He doesn't care and I'm not loved. I'm sitting here depressed and that's how I felt. And some of you feel that way. You don't want to sing Hosanna when you're down in the dumps. You don't want to sing He Reigns when you feel like your life is in in the toilet. And you don't want to talk about how he's a good, good father when you've gone through some suffering. But no matter what is going on in your life, you have to come to the understanding that he is a good God when bad things happen to us and that you are loved by him when no one else loves you. You have to know that in your heart and believe in that. And I was sitting in the upper balcony in the multi-purpose room there as they were preaching and they were singing that and that song came on and I was going to be so, so hard clenched fisted that I'm going to be, and God just broke my spirit. I found myself crying and just letting myself go and be in the moment to recognize, you know what? Yeah, life stinks right now. And there's some tough things that are going on. And some of it's because of my own clouded vision. But God was saying, I am a good God. And I love you, Steve, there in Joplin all by yourself. And God is saying that to you, that he loves you where you are. And I had to let myself just be in the presence of God. Something that is really, really difficult for me is to let myself be in the presence of worship. I think most guys are this way. We don't want to raise our hands because that's charismatic. We don't want to cry because that's acting like a sissy. We don't want to clap because we got no rhythm. And so we just stand there, right? And we don't get involved in worship and we're not moved. But God calls us to do that. Do not come to worship to see what everyone else is doing around you. Do not come to please your spouse because that's not enough. Don't come just so you have something to do on Sunday morning. You need to come to worship to experience the love of God, to give praise to his name, to be encouraged by the preaching of his word, to be joined together a body of believers and remembering what he has done for us on the cross of Calvary. That's why we come to worship. 
We need to come to be in awe of God, like the angels of Isaiah and Revelation who sang, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they didn't get tired of singing that chorus over and over again. I don't know why we complain so much, because the attributes of God are worth praising continuously. We need to listen to Paul when he said, I encourage every man to lift up holy hands to God in prayer and adoration to God. We need to be like David who danced in the temple before his Lord. We need to be like Miriam and the women who danced on the seashore there, because God had delivered them. We need to learn to be moved by the presence of God. The next thing is this. I had to learn to ask for help. I have encouraged many people to go to counseling, but have always resisted it myself. Aren't we good like that? We give all kinds of advice that we never take for ourselves. Oh, you should go on a diet. Oh, you should exercise. Oh, you should read more. You should pray more. You should come to church. You should get some counseling. And all those things are needed and necessary at times, but we don't do that. When I went to the counselor, I told her right off the bat, I said, I had a bad counseling experience when I was a kid, and it did not go very well, and I'm skeptical, and I don't like counseling. And she, she's probably thinking, oh, this guy's going to be a tough nut to crack. I said, nothing hits you personally, I just don't like him. You know, and we started from there. And I'm grateful that I wasn't so hardened as to not let her speak into my life and speak into Michelle and talk into my life. You got to learn to ask for help. I would not ask for help because I was so prideful. I didn't want anyone to think that my life is falling apart. There are two guys, I told them I was going to throw them under the bus and since they're not here, I will. Two guys in this church that, that, that I don't want to ever, that I never wanted to let myself down in front of. And it's, it's Eric and Darren. We're peers. We're around the same age. You know, being in the, in the law enforcement and military, you just got to act tough around one another. And, and I told that to Darren one day when I was sitting there because he's like, Steve, what's wrong with you? I was like, well, it's you. But I mean, so <laughs> I was telling him what, how I was feeling. I said, I didn't want to come say anything to you because I don't want you to think less of me that, you know, that you got to throw that trash out the window and just get some help and let, and let some of those barriers go. Michelle and I have been married for 22 years. I could not believe how oblivious we were to each other's feelings and how guarded we had been with our hearts and our hurts and our fears and our frustrations until I sat in that counseling session. I didn't realize she was as messed up as she is. <laughs> she... We, we sat in that counseling session and the lady, she's, Michelle's probably thinking, oh yeah, I knew that, I knew that. Well, let me tell you a couple that you haven't figured out that I know. I mean, for like two days, they were just hammering on me and I came in one day and I said, look, I want to know how we're going to fix her. Let's not talk about me anymore. Let's fix her. This is my problem, you know. She's a great blessing to me. Proverbs 20 verse 5 says this. The purposes of a man's heart are deep waters, but a man of understanding draws them out. You know, your hurts and your fears and the things you've gone through are extremely deep. And it takes someone with some godly understanding to draw some of that stuff out and, and let it go. You know? So let me just tell you this. If you're struggling, if you're going through some hard time, get some help. Don't be like me. Don't be too prideful to ask someone. Don't be so closed off and so, uh, you know, so inward focused that you don't, you don't let anyone know what's going on because you just, you just sit there and rot. You sit there and die spiritually on the inside. You know, I didn't put it in here, but there are passages over and over again in the scriptures that talk about when you refuse to get help, when you refuse to seek good godly counsel, the Bible says you're a fool. You are acting so foolish when you say, oh, I know what I need to do. I just need to do this and this and this. I don't need someone to tell me that. Well, like in the words of Dr. Phil, how's that working for you? You know, we all seem to know what to do, but we don't do it. Sometimes we need someone who can help us get going with it. Well, let me just wrap things up, Mark, as the team comes. Let me wrap things up and tell you, what's the lesson that I learned and that I'm continuing to learn? It's this, that we are all leaky vessels and we must learn to constantly be refreshed by the word and prayer and worship and fellowship. We need all of that all the time. A one-time conference is not enough to sustain you, no matter how good it is. Women's retreat, this women's retreat's coming up next, week, next weekend. It's going to be a great thing, but let me tell you, it's not going to be enough to sustain you all year long. A one-time fellowship meal at church is not going to be enough to have fellowship with one another. A one-time 
week of prayer. Well, I committed to praying for a week. That will not be enough to sustain you. Reading one book of the Bible, you know, hey, I read Philippians, that great big chapter, is not going to be enough. We leak out the spirit that's poured in us. And the joy doesn't stay in us forever. It seems to leak out and the happiness leaks out and the high mountaintop experiences leak out and all those things of were good comments. Someone says, you did a great job. You preach wonderful and everything like that. And, you know, I told him last week he did a good sermon. Well, by Monday, someone told me I didn't. It leaks out. And so I've learned this. You've got to keep coming to the well, drawing out the refreshing water of God each and every day. You've got to have it poured in you every single day through prayer and reading and Bible study and fellowship with people surround you who will build you up because you leak. We all need spiritual depends because we leak. We need to have, <laughs> that wasn't in the last sermon, shouldn't have been in this one either, but, uh, <laughs> but we need to have the word of God poured into us every day. Amen? All right, I ran way, way long, so let me just pray for us.